everybody. Welcome to the Abroaders Travel Podcast, your weekly meetup with thousands of entrepreneurs, hustlers, creators, nomads, ninjas, wanderers, and world changers, all seeking to build the skills and connections to live a life without borders. If you want to learn more about what we do or download our entire podcast archive, check out the website, abroaders.com. Happy Wednesday morning and welcome to another episode of the Abroaders Podcast. This is number 141 and today is Wednesday, September 21st and uh, AJ and I are checking in from Medellin, Colombia and today we are going to be covering some news and updates and also talking about listener bookings. We've had a bunch of amazing bookings submitted by you guys and uh, we wanted to talk over some of the best ones that have come in and uh, hopefully draw some conclusions that can help other people book similar trips. How's it going, man? Going well, man. Yeah, looking at these redemptions, these are some really, really nice redemptions that folks in the community booked. But getting back to uh, us being in Medellin, I feel like we need to make a little bit better effort to give the listeners an idea about the places we are. And one thing that I swear it's every day we experience is there is a strong culture, a service culture here. Everything that anyone does in the service industry is always con mucho gusto. Everyone is always just with gusto, with pleasure, just adamant about helping you. And it's, it's just never no problem. It's always not only no problem, but I'm happy to happy to do it for you. So I'm, I'm curious, you've been to other spots in Colombia. Is this a Medellin thing or a Colombian thing? It's actually, it's a little bit hard to remember, to be honest, because uh, it was like six years ago that I was in Bogota. I think it's sort of a Colombia thing. Definitely really, really friendly people. I've always found Latin America in general to just be a really welcoming and friendly place. But here it just, I think the contrast for me is like, there's a lot of places in Latin America where you really don't get quite the same standard of service that you expect in Europe or in the US, North America, just like a little bit slower. Everybody's kind of on a different schedule. Nobody's really sprinting around so much. And so it might take a while to get the check or it might take a while to get food. And while that's still sort of true in Colombia, uh, the enthusiasm that people have is just, is awesome. Uh, it's definitely one of the highlights for me about being here. Yeah, man, it's uh, it is great. Um, one final fun fact while we're on Medellin is uh, I wanted to bring up Rene Higuita. He's a famous goalkeeper, and I never knew he was Colombian. I honestly, for some reason, somebody told me he was a Mexican when I saw his famous highlight of his scorpion kick. Maybe some of you guys have seen it was in a friendly game at Wembley Stadium, uh, Colombia versus England, and this English guy puts uh, puts in a, a kick on the goal, and instead of using his hands or body or anything else, he just dives out and kicks his feet back up over his head to save the ball it's we'll have a we'll have a clip in the show notes but uh this guy was not only an interesting guy on that day he was he was a pretty lively character he's a famous guy in Colombia. and one fun fact about him is he actually missed the 1994 world cup because he was in prison and he was in prison because he was being the go-between between between pablo escobar and carlos molina to deliver ransom money to escobar to release molina's daughter and he didn't know that it was there was a law that you can't profit off kidnapping because he was he got paid to deliver this money to Escobar. He got paid like 60 grand by Molina to, to be the go-between and deliver money to Escobar to release his daughter, and he had no idea. So he missed the 94 World Cup because he was in jail. Man, that's uh, that's really a horrible thing to, to have happen, trying to, you know, you assume sort of do the right thing. And I would imagine, I mean, man, that's that's got to be a scary experience. And it's not the kind of thing you just volunteer to do for free. I mean, boy, I mean, you know, I have no idea how the, the legal system works down here, but it definitely was some pretty scary times, uh, maybe 20, 20 to 25 years ago. Yeah. And I would also imagine that that he was probably summoned. Yeah. I wouldn't imagine, like you said, that he just rolled up to Pablo Escobar's mansion and said, hey, by the way, if you just need a guy to do dangerous stuff for you, I'm here. Um, so yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, r- really, it's a sensation ridiculous, unnecessarily risky, but very, uh, very flashy save. We'll link to it in the show notes, have a YouTube video. Um, that's pretty much it. Now getting into the news and updates, we've got a few new things. Uh, the first one we're going to touch on is an increased sign-up bonus. Always good news. So this is the Barclay Arrival Plus. The bonus was sitting at 40,000 points, and now it is up to 50,000 points. So that, what is 50,000 points worth? It's $500 in travel. And this is nice because it's not just airfare or hotels, but it's you know timeshares, campgrounds, rental agencies, cruises, all sorts of travel things, and taxes and fees on award flights. So there is 
a stipulation where it must be at least what a hundred dollars. Yeah, and that changed. So if any of you folks had the uh, the Barclays arrival card when it came out, I think the minimum at that time was twenty five dollars was the the minimum amount you had to spend on travel to redeem a credit. And so now with it being a hundred, it's a little bit trickier. I'm kind of in an awkward spot. I think a lot of people are in where I've got less than ten thousand points, which is the minimum you need to redeem for travel. So I'm in this situation where my eight thousand points aren't really worth anything at the travel rates, uh, which are better than just redeeming for a gift card. I think uh, if you use 5,000 miles, you get a $25 gift card, whereas, or let's say 10,000 miles, you'd get a $50 gift card, whereas 10,000 miles will get you a $100 travel credit. So the one thing to keep in mind is just sort of plan accordingly, but definitely really nice news that the the sign-up offer has gone up and none of the other uh, attributes have changed. So it's still the same 3,000 spend in 90 days um, and uh, pretty cool card just in general to kind of cover the taxes and fees because it's the one thing that you pretty much always have to pay for. So if you want to get a totally free trip, this is kind of a good opportunity. It's also a nice way to just buy cheap paid flights when it doesn't make sense to use miles. There's no you know distance-based chart that has a good opportunity, and it just doesn't make sense to use points on a regional type, uh, region-based chart. This is a nice uh, place to fill in the gap and be able to, to use some other points. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing we didn't mention is there's a 5% points back. So for example, you re- redeem 50,000 points, you get 2,500 points back. Not a huge deal, but it's always nice to get a little bit more than you expected. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing about that is really, it means that you never zero out your balance. So it's kind of a clever thing for them because they added that hundred dollar minimum for the travel. So a lot of people are kind of stuck in that position where they redeemed all their points, but then they got a few back. And so now they got to use them again. So, uh, it's definitely not a card I would put a lot of everyday spending on, but it's great for the sign up bonus. And, uh, there's actually one other card that I had even forgotten about until we, we just got started here, but the Amex business gold has has also jumped up pretty substantially. So uh, that card was previously at 25000 And again, same thing, no changes. So still 5000 spend in 90 days, but now we're up to 50,000 points. Yeah. And the one thing about that card, the, the person that is absolutely a no-brainer for is the business owner that does a lot of spending on paid advertising. This is Google AdWords. This is Facebook ads because you get 3x points on that. So if you've got any type of ad spend, you can get a miles printing machine. We all know how valuable Amex points are. So if you're a business owner out there, you do a lot of paid traffic online and you do not have this card, this is this is a must. And this is a perfect time to get it because you get an extra 25,000 points. Yeah, absolutely. So before we move on to the next items and news and updates, uh, for all you guys who are looking for either links for this or anything else we cover in the show today, uh, show notes are going to be at abroaders.com forward slash listener bookings. Uh, okay, so we've got a couple more news items to just co- cover briefly. There's one real quick one. You guys can go to the show notes to check this out, but there's a quick opportunity to take about two minutes to sign up for a Wall Street Journal subscription. You can cancel it after a couple months and you can get a thousand United points. Um, so worth, you know, maybe $25 or something like that if you use the points right. So worth uh, worth maybe a few minutes, especially if you actually like the Wall Street Journal and want to subscribe anyways. Yeah, it's not a, not a bad deal. Quick, quick, easy win, especially, I mean, if you happen to be at like 20 29,000 points. Spend you know, spend a dollar to get where you need to be. Uh, the next thing is Frequent Miler wrote an interesting post on if Chase biz cards count towards 524. And I guess the only real news is there's no news. It's a maybe. We don't quite know. Um, if you're interested in all the stuff behind the 524 rules and eligibility, Frequent Miler is pretty good on uh, being a little bit ahead of the curve and before it's on all the blogs. He's he's typically spot on. So uh, we'll link to that once again in the show notes. Yeah, it seems like the, the conclusion from the article is that there's a lot of personal evidence, a lot of people that read his blog and that have contributed that have specifically cited that Chase is not counting its own business cards. So they like knew exactly, they went to their credit report, they counted up all the cards that were opened in the last 24 months, and they knew that they had five if you included the business cards, or they had six if you included the business cards, and they still got approved. So there's no real hard evidence in terms of Chase saying the policy goes one way or the other, but it's definitely worth a read if you're under 524 with personal personal cards and over with business cards. And it's also often true, especially if you use a EIN number for your business, that other banks' business cards are not going to count. So Amex and city business cards may not count either. Definitely check out the article if you're on the fringe of the 524 and are considering signing up for the 100K bonus with the Sapphire Reserve card. 
That's good stuff, man. He's always got he's always got good insights. Uh, next thing we've got here is some availability alerts. So it looks like between Japan and Australia, we've got some wide open availability in Qantas business class, and we've also got some good availability in Ava business class, which I actually have flown from Taipei to New York. It's like a 15 and a half hour flight. It was lifesaver. It's how, how was the business class for that? Man, I would say it's really good. I'm trying to think if, uh, I would say it was, it was similar, similar service to Cathay Pacific. So really good. I'd say the hard product was maybe, maybe not quite as good, but it was, it was, it was really good. I, it would be hard to imagine that the business class would be much better. Food was good. Drinks were good. Service was great. Seat was very comfortable. Lie flat. I slept. So, I mean, you can't really ask for much more. And it looks like the routes that we've got open here is uh, Chicago, Houston, LA, New York, San Francisco, and Seattle to Taipei, which is in Taiwan, which is where Ava is based. And I should also tell you guys that this is not something that we discovered. So this is something that's been posted on a lot of the highly read blogs. And so if you're thinking like, oh, I've, I've been trying to get my family of four in business class to Asia, don't wait on this because it's not just us talking to you know a few thousand. There's probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are sort of hearing about this availability. So definitely move quick, but it's a lot of dates. I mean, it's like months and months of availability. Uh, the other piece, just running back real quick to the... Uh, the Japan to Australia, uh, one thing that you're, you're, most people are probably coming from the U.S., and that's one of the hardest routes to Australia. The U.S. to Australia and New Zealand is really tricky. It's been bad for a long time, and Qantas has been non-existent for a long time. I mean, if you're going to get anything, it's going to be on American, mm -hmm. at least in the last six months. And so having this opened up to Tokyo, it's possible to potentially fly from the West Coast to Tokyo, spend a little bit of time there, uh, and then continue on with a Qantas business class flight. I think it's about a 10 and a half or 11 hour flight from Tokyo, maybe even a little bit more. So it's pretty substantial, uh, quite a good deal for the business class. Um, so definitely check that out if you haven't been able to find direct flights from, from the US to get to Australia or to New Zealand. And one final thing for the availability to Taipei is it's only 500 miles from Hong Kong, from HKG, Cathay Pacific Hub. So that means you can get a one-way economy ticket using your British Airways Avios for just 4500 bucks, And that can be your launching pad to a lot of places in Asia because Hong Kong services much more than Taipei. But either way, it's nice to know that you've got that in your back pocket, a short, cheap flight, not that long of a flight. So you don't have to worry about doing it in business class. And then you've got, you know, your gateway to Asia. Yeah, I, I really love Hong Kong as a jumping point. It's really easy to get to Bangkok. It's really easy to get to Ho Chi Minh City. Um, there's just a lot of routes that are offered. And also, you can use British Airways miles on uh, Dragon uh, Dragon Air, which is Cathay Pacific sort of uh, subsidiary, kind of the equivalent of like American Eagle. And uh, so really nice for that. Uh, the one thing to remember is if you don't have any intention of stopping in Hong Kong and there is Star Alliance availability, you can, if you're using United, you can can include other stops on the way to Asia as long as you don't stop for more than 24 hours. So if the goal is to just get to Beijing, China as fast as possible, uh, by all means, do the rest of the flight in business class if it's available. But this is a great option if, A, you want to stop for a little while in Taipei, so you end your, your international itinerary there, or B, you want to spend a little time in Hong Kong and, and bounce around Asia. Yeah, man, that's good stuff. That's all we've got for the news and updates. And before we jump into the core content, we had a recent development here in Medellin with our business partner Jake and his flight back to Minneapolis. So we're going to give you a quick rundown about where things went wrong. We're in the middle of this right now. So we're telling you kind of what we're doing, what we've done, what our options are. So to break it down for you, Jake's flight was delayed 10 hours. The itinerary was something we pieced together. We went Air France from Medellin to Atlanta. That was a little over 17,500 points, just under a hundred bucks in taxes and fees. And then we tacked on a Southwest flight to get from Atlanta to Minneapolis, where we had a voucher for 200 bucks. So we figured we'd piece it together, it cost us nothing, we already had it. But once again, this flight was delayed 10 hours. So the arrival originally was supposed to be 1230 in Atlanta. And he was supposed to depart a little bit before floor, before four o'clock from Atlanta to Minneapolis. But that's not happening because as good as we can do right now is he gets into Atlanta late at night and looks like maybe a hotel. Yeah. So like the first of all, this is the second time this has happened to Jake and second time with Flying Blue, uh, not Flying Blue's problem or fault for, for right. the second time in a row as well. So again, Delta, who everybody says, is sort of the best airline. They never screw up. They're always on time. Well, they're 
really not on time recently for us. Um, and the, the reason I wanted to talk with you guys about this is that I do think there's sort of a, a checklist that I kind of started going through immediately when I woke up this morning and found out Jake's flight was was delayed. Um, and I wanted to kind of run through this because um, I, I do think like there's a lot of really good opportunities to save points by combining itineraries with two different frequent flyer programs. So we used Air France to get to Atlanta. We actually bought a paid ticket with Southwest to get to Minneapolis. But there's a risk inherent when you do that because Delta is not responsible for getting Jake to mm -hmm. Minneapolis. They're just responsible for getting him to Atlanta. And so even if they get him there 10 hours late, it's not really their problem that he missed his Southwest flight. And so a couple of key things, I'm going to run you guys through kind of the checklist I went through when I first started trying to resolve the problem. But just as an overall note, Southwest is a really nice airline to add as the second part of a combined trip. So when you're returning to the US, and the advantage there is if something does go wrong, you can cancel the Southwest and rebook it. If you book it with miles, it's totally free uh, up to 10 minutes before departure. So that's really, really good. Like you show up way too late, you're never going to make it, you can still probably get on your phone and, and cancel the flight or call Southwest. So it's really nice to have that flexibility. So anyways, here's what I did. First of all, we took a look at connecting flights. He's obviously not going to make it 10 hour delay and we only built in a three and a half hour layover. Uh, second step here was that we know Delta is not going to be responsible for the final destination. So it's either buy a later flight uh, or just rebook something completely from scratch. And so there aren't any other connecting flights. A lot of times you're lucky if you can get into the new continent. I, a lot of people hate red eyes, but the advantage with a red eye, if you're pushing them together, is that you show up early, early in the morning and you've got the full day to get other flights mm -hmm. out if something goes wrong. Whereas in Jake's situation, he's now getting in at 11 o'clock because of his delay in the evening. There's no other flight, so he's going to have to overnight in Atlanta. Okay, so we're facing an overnight. There's there's no chance of getting another flight to the final destination. Kind of the first thing that I checked down to was just rebooking the entire itinerary from scratch because possibly now the availability is different than it was when we weren't able to get the saver price all the way to Minneapolis. So give us a rundown of like what the options are for, for fixing that. Yeah, so we've got some pretty good options. We've got you know a very diverse portfolio of points. We've got British Airways, American Airlines, Delta, Air France, JetBlue, and Southwest. So British Airways on AA, we've got some availability to Miami. JetBlue could get us to Fort Lauderdale, and Delta can get us to Atlanta, but that was the one we had booked, and that was canceled. Um, so as far as doing the route research, uh, Medellin, like you said, doesn't have much as far as direct flights in the United States. So, I mean, JetBlue to Fort Lauder Lauderdale, like I said, AA to Miami, and then uh, United or Avianca, you can go to Panama City and New York and Miami. So not a whole lot there. So we ended up deciding to stick with the first flight and then take it from Atlanta to Minneapolis and deal with... Uh, you know, whatever we could do as far as hotels and getting him to Minneapolis from Atlanta. Yeah. So next step up here, after we kind of figured out, and by the way, you know, when we checked through those options, AJ ran through, there just wasn't anything very good. Um, and also I think Star Alliance was probably the best in terms of options, but they still have that close in booking fee. So you're paying an extra 75 bucks. Um, and so anyways, the next thing that I thought of was that we needed to see if there was going to be any compensation that we were covered for uh, in terms of, you know, being able to be reimbursed for a hotel or any other paid transportation or other stuff that was going to come up. Um, and so that actually turned out to be uh, a big fail. And I knew it was going to be when we booked the ticket. Uh, there was one seat left on the flight that we wanted, mm -hmm. and I didn't have Jake's credit card number at the time. But a really important thing for everybody to know is that almost universally, personal credit cards are just going to cover you and your immediate family. So you, your spouse or domestic partner, and your kids, and that's it. So business cards, some of them are a little bit better where if it's a business-related trip, an employee could still be covered, but it's not awesome. So the idea ideal scenario when you're you're booking a ticket for someone else with your miles is to have them pay the taxes and fees with their card. It's just going to be a lot smarter because had we done that, Jake would have had like $500 to use for transportation and hotel and stuff like that. So one thing that we should point out is if you do not have a credit card with good 
benefits it covers you in those situations is sometimes the airlines or there's rules or laws that require uh, the airlines to compensate you. And actually, there's a great website Eric found. It's uh, www.airhelp.com. And uh, it's really interesting. So we looked into this. So the EU rules are really interesting. The EU hammers the airlines for being late and being delayed over three hours or what have you. So Air France is an EU airline. However, there's different rules depending on where they're operating. And because they were not operating in the EU, uh, Jake is not entitled to the, the 400 euros or whatever he would have been entitled to had this been in the EU. Uh, but but as Eric pointed out to me, this website's a really good resource because it's not just about the EU. It's what you're entitled to in the United States and traveling elsewhere. Yeah. And one of the things that blew me away was the stats on how uh, how much the airlines get away with giving people less compensation than they're legally entitled to. And so that was like a huge thing that like like 70 or 80 percent of people don't get what they actually could get they just take that hundred dollar voucher and they're just like oh okay so uh before you accept and it is possible i think for to sort of take some initial compensation and then say like that wasn't enough but that's a little bit risky right mm-hmm. so you you probably want to spend a little bit of time and take a look i think delta tried to offer jake a hundred bucks is what he he texted me which I'm pretty sure he's entitled to at least 200 under under the laws for being 10 hours delayed so uh use this website and there's some other good resources out there but but bottom line, know your rights. Okay, so to wrap it up, uh, we decided to rebook that Southwest flight from Atlanta to Minneapolis. Um, just ended up paying the difference, so we didn't pay that much extra and decided we're going to find Jake a hotel and put him up. And so as far as hotels go, there's really a couple options. So if you do have coverage, if you've got, uh, you know, you booked it with Chase Sapphire and you're entitled to, what, $500 for a hotel, then... Uh, then what you want to do is you want to find a hotel that's going to earn you a lot of points, right? Yeah. So, you, I mean, ideally you book a, you know, book a hotel, you'll be in reimbursed, not a huge deal on that. However, since we're in a different situation with Jake, we were going out of pocket. So we didn't have compensation quite yet, so we decided to book something with points. And there's a couple great resources as far as booking hotels with points. The first one is Hotel Hustle, which is from Seth at the Wandering Armenian blog on Boarding Area. And the other one is the hotel maps from Drew from Travel is Free. So those are great resources. Um, we found a couple options, 4,000 Starwood points or 10,000 Marriott points. That seems kind of like an obvious decision. However, Marriott points are just worth almost nothing. So 10K Marriott points is actually not a bad deal there. Yeah, I think it's kind of close. I mean, that, that's sort of a push, but the, the situation was like Marriott points. Jake actually had a bunch of those, and uh, we don't have that many Starwood points. And so it seemed like a better choice to just save the Starwood points. Those can become airline miles later. Uh, so the Marriott was a, a pretty good deal. Most Marriott redemptions are like in the forty or 50,000 points. So a 10K redemption was pretty good, uh, and it's going to be a nice property right at the airport. But definitely check out Hotel Hustle. Uh, I think the biggest thing about that resource is that it ranks the redemptions by cents by per point. So you really don't have to do any work. It gives you the chance to do, uh, you know, to be able to see what the pay rate would be if you were going to pay for that hotel straight up and then how, how many cents per point you're getting for your points. And it just ranks them in order. So it's really easy to actually figure out what the best deal is. It also shows cash and points redemptions. Um, and the last piece is that uh, it covers pretty much all of the major loyalty programs. So in one single search, you can look at Hyatt, you can look at Starwood, Marriott, IHG, um, and probably four or five other ones that I can't quite think of. That's good stuff. All right. So to summarize everything, here's the numbers we're working with. We ended up paying $200 more for the difference in that Southwest fare and 10,000 Marriott points. So not too bad considering we went self-insured on that. We pieced together two itineraries knowing there's some risks involved with that. So we're out 200 bucks, 10,000 Marriott points, which is not worth much to us as far as the Marriott points go. Now to gain, we should be able to get some compensation here. So we should be able to get you know, a decent amount of points from Delta. I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 points possibly from Delta for the delay, maybe. So that would be somewhat in line. I mean, we've had some issues with Delta in the past. That's kind of where they've set the market for compensation. So should be able to get some Delta points. And I guess we'll keep you guys updated on how that negotiation goes and tell you what Delta was willing to give us for jacking up our travel plans. All right, AJ. So let's jump in to some listener bookings. I was super inspired. We've been collecting these for quite a while now. 
Uh, and it's actually starting to pick up quite a bit. We've had a lot of recent bookings, and it's just super excited to see people c succeeding at booking their trips. Uh, so we're going to run through a few bookings, just to give you guys some ideas of what's possible, and then make any notes. One of the great things about this is a lot of folks were super generous with their time and actually listed some some really interesting takeaways from the bookings. What was challenging? What they were, you know, what was easy? Uh, any tips for other people that are trying to do the same thing? Uh, so we're going to do our best to cover those as well well. And we will also have the link to submit your booking in the show notes. We would really, really appreciate if you would do that. Helps us get better information, more data points on how much miles are worth. And also we've learned a ton from seeing these bookings come in. Uh, so please share your successes as well. Yeah, man. I, I just have to reiterate, I love uh, how, how much success we've seen the listeners have as far as the bookings go. And, and this is a couple things. It's cool to see that maybe we help these people out and We've actually learned some stuff from a lot of listeners. There's there's definitely some listeners that know what the hell they're doing, and they're really good. And it's cool to cool to see them succeeding on their own independently. All right. So first up, we've got a booking from Michael. Uh, Michael booked a Chicago to Hong Kong to Saigon flight in economy using American Airlines miles. Uh, it was 37,500 miles plus about $50. And the retail price of the cheapest ticket that he could find around his dates uh, was about $1,060. So uh, with that valuation, it comes out to about 2.7 cents per point, which is really solid. Uh, and on top of that, Michael was able to take advantage of the Starwood Preferred Guest to American Airlines transfer bonus. Now, that did end on the 14th of September, so it's not available now. But hopefully, at some point, it'll be back. Uh, but that basically meant he had some American points already. Uh, so he only transferred 20000 which meant he got the normal 5000 bonus, which is still available. Uh, but on top of that, there was an extra 5000 bonus. So he transferred 20000 Starwood points, got 30000 AA miles, which means the total cost of his trip was only actually 27,500 points. And so if you look at it like that, that's 3.7 cents per point on this redemption, which is really, really awesome. Um, so it looks like uh, on top of all of this, he also booked this ticket at a pretty tough time of the year to book travel. Basically, between Christmas and New Year's is pretty ugly in most cases uh, for award redemptions. And so Michael's actually going to be stopping in Hong Kong on New Year's Eve and catching the next flight out uh, on the way to Saigon the following day. And so this brought up a pretty cool thing that I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of. American Airlines, if you stop more than 24 hours, is going to bill you separately for each of those redemptions. But if you keep it to 20 23 hours and 59 minutes or less, you can get a nice long stop and actually get to do something in, in the city that you arrive in. Uh, and so for Michael, uh, he had a couple of takeaways here that I wanted to share. Uh, it's worth noting that he he booked this in economy. So he was actually possibly looking for business class tickets. And so it's worth mentioning that Cathay Pacific is really good at opening up flights last minute for bookings with miles. So if you use a uh, an American Airlines currency, you use your American points to book a ticket on Cathay Pacific, uh, and there isn't enough space in the class of service you want, there's two important things to know. One is that you can actually change your ticket. You can upgrade to business or first class if it becomes available at no charge. So uh, as long as it's the same cities, uh, it's not going to be an issue. Um, and I'd recommend using British Airways website. Uh, that's the best free source to look at Cathay Pacific availability. Um, so you can see that up great space. And for Michael, it probably, if he looked, you know, now it probably doesn't make sense to be checking this every day unless it's super important that he gets that business class. Um, but, you know, start looking maybe two weeks out and see what happens because a lot of times in the last like three or four days, especially they just open up like all but one business class seat for miles because they know they're not going to sell them. Um, so the other thing is if upgrading is super important, I did want to pass on one resource that can really supercharge your search so that you don't have to wake up every morning and look at British Airways horrible website over your coffee and crumpets. And uh, that's going to be to use Award Nexus. Uh, and so Award Nexus is a service that we use for our booking service. It's got access to a ton of different websites. It is a paid service, um, but they've got kind of interesting packages for a single trip where you can just monitor the flights and see if anything shows up and it'll send you an email immediately if there's any availability. So that's really nice if you're just kind of sitting on those. It's about 45 bucks, uh, and that covers two travelers to three destinations. And so basically, Michael could set that alert and have it check for availability every morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time or whatever time he wants, and then it'll email him as soon as something's available. 
Man, that's great. I think one takeaway that we didn't focus on much is, Michael, good on you for getting a free stopover in Hong Kong on New Year's. I would imagine that Hong Kong New Year's is pretty awesome. I mean, I know it's not the Chinese New Year's and it's kind of China, but still, I guarantee that there's a lot of action there. So that's pretty cool. Um, The next one we've got here, I absolutely love this one because this is the first listener that we've, uh, you know, heard feedback from about booking an award to Cuba. So we've got Emily and she booked an award from Seattle to, let me see if I can figure out how to say this, Cienfuegos, Cuba, in, a, in a, thank you, in an in economy class. So we're looking at 30,000 AA miles per person plus taxes and fees. And you can expect that to be between 20 and $40 on a round trip. We didn't get the exact numbers from Emily, but it's pretty safe to assume that's what it is. Now, the paid flights were looking close to $900 per person round trip. So that takes us to around 2.75 cents per point, which is a really nice redemption on AA, considering what we value those points at. And uh, some nice things that Emily provided for us is she shared some tips, because traveling to Cuba is not like traveling to, say, England or France or Germany. Uh, The first one, make sure you have the phone fee waived, because you can't book this online yet. Um, Some of the agents may not know about that, but you're going to just need to ask for the phone fee to be waived because they are going to try to get you for, I believe it's $75 on the phone. I think it's 40 for international per person. So for her case, it would have been 80 uh, with with the two people, depending on whether they were booked on the same itinerary. I know she uh, said they were traveling on different dates. So uh, one way or another, I believe it's 30 domestic and and 40 international. But either way, if you can't book it on the website, it should be waived. Uh, Maybe it's worth to to pay the fee if you you don't want to hang up and wait on hold for a really long time. But uh, most agents should know. And if not, ask for a supervisor. They should waive it for you. Uh, The next thing she noted was she used Cuba Travel Services. So they partner with American Airlines. It's $85 for the visa. It's one form. She said it arrived in, you know, under five days. Three to five days is what you should be looking at. And then the final thing is just be persistent because lots of AA agents were not aware that you could redeem miles to go to Cuba because this is a new thing. That's a change of pace for the agents and you can't book it online. Yeah. And two other things that I I came away with. So I started looking at paid flights just to kind of see, like, it seemed really high that the, the flight was not. $900 $900 per person. And number one, they actually are really high. I didn't quite see that high at the dates I was looking at, but like $600 round trip easily. And it was super hard to find an OTA that would actually show prices to Cuba. I looked at Google Flights. I looked at ITA Matrix. I looked at Expedia and Kayak, and none of them had any prices for flights to Cuba. Skyscanner is the one. Uh, so if you are looking at paid flights, uh, that might be a good place to start. Uh, one thing too, on maybe why those are so expensive is that's about as far of a flight as you can take from the continental US to Cuba. She's coming from Seattle. So big difference between hopping on a flight from Miami to Cuba versus Seattle. So, uh, I mean, maybe that's another reason. And one more thing people that want to go to Cuba should know is that it has opened up, but there are still particular travel requirements that need to be met. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, Eric, you said it was what the the person to person exchange of ideas looks to be like the most commonly used one, but but like I said, we'll link to that in the show notes so you'll be able to see you know what your reason for going to Cuba could be. So Emily, thank you so much for sharing that. That's really exciting. Congratulations on being the first person I know of personally to use Miles to get to Cuba. Yeah, super exciting. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Okay, so up next, we've got Tony, and uh, this one's a business class redemption. I thought this was super exciting as well. So Tony uh, booked a trip from the United States to Japan in business class. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was based out of New York and ended up booking his trip from Chicago. So this was one of those areas that I thought could be a helpful takeaway just because a lot of times in business class, it's a little bit tricky to get direct flights, especially those really uh, high traffic paid ticket markets like New York to Tokyo. There's a lot of people buying business class. There's a lot of companies that are flying people back and forth. Um, So Tony did a really nice job of looking around and realizing that there were other flights uh, from major hubs in the U.S. Um, And so it looks like this one just required a positioning flight to Chicago. Maybe Tony already had some plans there as well, but that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, So this redemption uh, was 75,000 ANA miles. uh, And so that came out to with $90 in taxes and fees from Chicago to Narita. And that's a really good deal, especially because those particular tickets were retailing for $6,300 a piece. Um, and frankly, that's that's actually kind of common. I've seen that a lot. Um, you know, sometimes you can catch a good deal, but a lot of times you're going to see really high prices. Yeah, I mean, especially considering that ANA is a is a legitimate airline with a very nice business class. And one thing I wanted to touch on for the listeners is none of you 
probably are sitting on ANA miles unless you live in Japan. So they are a transfer partner of Amex. And the final caveat is there is no one way award travel. So you got to have enough miles to do the thing round trip. So good on you, Tony, for racking up the Amex points and dumping them to ANA for this is a massive redemption 90 bucks, uh, 75,000 points round trip, business class, long haul, retailing over six grand. That's, uh, that's top notch. Yeah, it's a it's an incredibly good deal. Uh, I think it comes out to like eight point three cents per point if you're if you're actually going to buy that ticket retail. Um, a couple of tips that Tony shared, and I thought this was really good. I had actually forgotten about the Chrome Award Flights plugin. Um, so this is pretty cool. It actually works a little bit like Award Nexus that we were talking about earlier. It's totally free. Uh, it doesn't have the features where you can email, you know, have email alerts and stuff. But just in terms of a better interface than using British Airways or some of the other websites like ANA to search for availability. So check out the Chrome plugin. It's uh, If you search award.flights, you should find it in the Chrome store, um, but we'll also link to the place where you can install that in the show notes. Uh, he said the biggest challenge was just sort of figuring out the, the dates. Um, you know, he had kind of a restricted uh, set of dates. One of the big things that you want to do when you have that sort of situation is just try and plan as far in advance as possible. A lot of times you might not be able to book till a few months out, but uh, anyways, it looks like Tony did a really nice job, uh, and especially considering that there was an availability from his first choice of airports, still managed to get a really great redemption. So uh, yeah, congrats, Tony, and thanks a bunch for sharing. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. Again, all of the links and notes from today's episode are going to be at abroaders.com slash listener bookings. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Definitely check out the show notes. Uh, if you found any of this stuff relevant to your travel plans, we've got two Big new sign-up bonuses to take a look at. Also, information about your rights. If something goes wrong with your flight, make sure you get all the compensation you're entitled to. Uh, also have those resources, including uh, the Chrome plugin for flights, uh, Ward Nexus, and a bunch of other tools and resources to help you guys book hotels, book flights, and make the most of the points that you have. Yeah, one final thing. If any of you listeners out there are going to sign up for that Barclay card or the Amex card, if you've decided it's the right card for you, we will be forever forever grateful if you use our links because we will get a commission on that if you use the links on the show notes page. Awesome. Thanks, guys. We will see you next week at AM Eastern Standard Time. Hey, broaders, don't be shy. Hop over to the website and join our email list for exclusive travel hacking content. If you like what we're up to, the best way you can support the show is by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. Lastly, we would love to hear from you, so send your show feedback to Eric 